This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on March 26th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. My guest today is... Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Coming back a second time on TWIV, Mark Dennison. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Vince. It's really nice to join you. You were, you were last on TWIV five years ago, episode 332, Vanderbilt Virology. I just looked it up, picture of you and Jim Crow and Seth Bordenstein in that little room. <laughs> Seems and like, I looked a lot, and I looked a lot younger. We all I'm did. Sure. We all did. It seems like ages ago. In fact, I just saw you in what February in in Washington, right. and yep. this thing was just getting started. And I don't think either of us knew the extent to which uh, it would spread. Did you? No. Um, I, I was an interesting meeting, and we were uh, there were issues about you know safety and security and, and things like that. And you, and I remember you and I both were um, looking in real time at our phones and seeing this begin to uh, yeah. explode in China and uh, both um, arguing or discussing that, that, that maybe we should be thinking about these issues associated with a real event, not a theoretical event, because it looked like one was developing before our eyes. Indeed. Um, so tell us before we do some science, what's the situation like in Nashville? Is it deserted? Um, I, it, it looked like it walking in this morning. Um, Vanderbilt has mandatory at home, uh, like most places do now, um, for except for essential research. Um, our lab is a long, long hallway, and we have um, deployed everybody in every empty lab we can in the hallway with separate benches. Um, so obviously our work up here is BSL-2, but our BSL-3 work is in a, in a separate lab. And so we are... I'm sort of very actively engaged, but there's, you know, there's screening and temperature checking now. And mm. um, the city is pretty much, pretty much shut down. You know, it's a tourist city. It's obviously not on the scale of New York, but it's really, really impacting the city pretty dramatically. So your lab has for years worked on coronaviruses. Are, is everyone essentially continuing to do that? We are. We've been given permission for um, all of the, all the faculty, staff, and, um, and even a, a grad student and medical student to continue work. Mm -hmm. um, some of that is focused on, on on rapid testing with you know BSL two model and MHV. Others doing issues associated with uh, mutagenesis of some of some clones and um, trying to really understand that. And then really the focus has been on and our antiviral studies. So uh, testing uh, remdesivir and NHC, the two compounds we'd identified as well as uh, rapidly trying to look at some compounds that we think might have impact and also some that we have been proposed that we think would not have impact because we think it's just as important to show the ones that don't work mm. that are being pushed forward as the ones that might work that we could advance. Okay. All right. So let's, um, I want to ask a couple of background questions. Then we'll, I want to talk about antivirals. Um, can you, can you take us through, the pathogenesis of infection, the virus enters the upper tract. What happens next? Well, you know, <clears throat> most of what we do is, is still models, but there's data coming out every day that I can't possibly keep <laughs> up with. We haven't really had great um, pathogenesis models yet, and those are just developing, obviously, uh, labs like Ralph Barracks and, and Stan Perlman's, all the people who have really, you know, really moved this work forward in pathogenesis in the past are really highly interested in getting mouse models going um, quickly. Um, the, I guess the pathogenesis really is is likely entry into the upper respiratory tract. I, I'm fascinated by some of the stuff, the findings that are coming out with people. This idea that people one and I've heard some people say it that loss of smell is one of the first things that they're noticing, um, and that suggests that you may be entry through through the upper the nasal epithelium possibly. You know, titers of the virus have ever been very high in the oropharynx and the nasopharynx, even in saliva. And so suggesting that this is different from SARS. SARS was really focused on a virus that possibly entered did some primary replication in the ep in the airway rep rep epithelium, and then really targeted the lungs. And that's probably one reason it was so easily controlled, or it was readily controlled by public health measures, is because it was 
disease was and transmission was associated with really pneumonia, bad pneumonia. And this virus is obviously different. So I think we can propose pathogenesis by saying that it's engaging the upper airway epithelium, possibly in the nose or in the throat uh, with uh, earlier symptoms and then spread to the lungs in some cases. That's why you're seeing the range of disease. The disease with SARS, as we know, was really both virological early and then immunopathological with with uh, damage to the uh, alveoli, um, the small airway epithelium, ciliated airway epithelium, and then leading really to a cascade of, of cytokine expression um, and uh, sort of the, the body pouring gasoline to try to put out the fire. You know, so really a bad resulting in what's called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is really an endpoint disease. Um, that is associated with lots of different severe respiratory infections, bacterial and viral. So we we hear that about 80% of infections are mild. Would you say those are the ones where virus is mainly in the upper tract? I think so. I mean, it's, it's, I'm, it's going to take years to digest this, but mm-hmm. we see everything from those who really just have a day or two of fever mm-hmm. and mild symptoms to people who may have two to three weeks of fever with, you know, a cough and a bronchitis to those that have progression to uh, severe pneumonia and, and ARDS. There's even, interestingly, in some kids I know, and, and, and likely in some other people, there's an asymptomatic infection. But when people were screening with CT scans in China, for example, and other things or radiologically here in the U.S., they're finding radiologic changes by CT or, or X-ray in people that really have very mild to no symptoms. So I think we're seeing this virus is really exploring, uh, really exploring human biology. Um, it, you know, uh, I, I keep coming back to the idea that this is a brand new virus in humans. There's 7 billion people who are n- immune naive. This virus has no need to do anything with its, um, with its genetics because it seems to be fully formed from the head of Zeus ready to just explore human biology, you know? So it's really, you know, that's fascinating and scary at the same time. Yeah, I, I get a lot of questions about, oh, is the virus going to change? Is it going to get worse? I th- and I say just what you have said, it's pretty damn good to begin with. Yeah, I, if, if I, yeah, I love to comment to our, you know, to virologists about this because I think I, I wrote down here this morning, I thought, I'm going to talk to Vince. Here's what things I want to think about, right? <laughs> this is just going to be seasonal. There are going to be mutations. What's its origin? Is it going to become endemic? You know, these all kind of link together. And I, I think... I've been trying to think of this just from purely from a selection perspective, you know, de-anthropomorphize the virus Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that here we have a virus that entered into humans and showed almost no change, right? It it was, it was a point outbreak in a sense, and it's clading out only geographically, not disease wise. The disease is staying consistent and the same. There's, and there's more and more information that this isn't making dramatic changes. We can talk about the coronavirus biology, but I think just from an evolutionary perspective, this virus is ready to go. It's fascinating generalist that's able to, to, to overcome all of the kinds of obstacles we think about the virus having to enter into a new population. And I, I just, so it doesn't need to make mutations. Can coronavirus make mutations? Of course they can. They can do rapid adaptation under selection. Um, they can be very, however, they also have proofreading function and they can be extremely stable when they're not under selective pressure. And this virus looks like it is not under a lot of selective pressure from humans. So this is now a human virus that's saying, yeah, the field's open, let's go and play. And I think that that's um, fascinating. So, you know, is it going to be seasonal? Well, you know, anybody that tells you it's going to be seasonal or it's going to become a simple endemic virus in a year, they're basing that on viruses that may have been in humans for thousands or millions of years. We don't know how seasonality occurs. And first of all, viruses aren't seasonal. They're migratory, right? They move between hemispheres. And this virus is already in the southern hemisphere and in the tropics, and it's expanding in those regions. So I think this idea of it suddenly becoming a happy seasonal virus or becoming an endemic cold type virus, it's still got, a, it's got several billion people to, to think about before it has any reason to do that. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from people wanting to uh, look at the good side of what might happen, right? And and I understand that completely. And I think we should, but what I don't want that to do is waylay us from uh, preparation and the kinds of long-term difficult struggle it may be to work with this, to to get this under control. So the, the uh, community spread of, of this virus, which is, as I understand, different from SARS-1, that's in part because of the asymptomatic infections, the upper tract replication, would you say? I I think it's, 
Yes. And, and, and Vince Munster had a nice paper and there've been some others. I apologize to anybody I leave out because I can't keep up is, you know, that this has some aerosol survival for a couple hours. Right. And I think those were done in drums. Those were done under stable conditions, but it suggests that, that there is a, a mechanism. You know, when we think about, of course, everybody who knows like measles and chicken pox, right. I, if someone had chicken pox and I was immune sensitive, and I walked into the room two hours after they left, I could get chicken pox, mm-hmm. right? If I was, if I was immune naive, measles is the same, right? Exceptionally infectious, exceptionally stable as aeros- as, as small particle aerosols. Uh, like I was walking down the street the other night and um, I thought I was alone and I smelled tobacco smoke and I, where's this coming from? And I walked for another 30 feet and there's a guy sitting in his truck smoking a cigarette. I smelled that tobacco smoke, you know, 40 feet back behind him. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's how this virus, this, if that's my worst case scenario for how this virus might be working, but I wouldn't smell it. Yeah. And yeah. I think that it's, um, I think that it, the spread is likely from people who have higher titers in the upper respiratory tract and may have very mild symptoms or maybe pre-symptomatic. I kind of prefer that term to asymptomatic because it, 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 I don't know, its implications are different, but I think mm. that definitely spread can occur in with people who will have no idea who their contact is suggesting that there's not a lot of sick people around them coughing or sneezing. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the, the pathogenesis also, there seems to be this, this bias in serious infections in very old or older people, I would say, then the very young seem to be spared of more serious pathogenesis. And I know we don't have an answer, but I'd be curious about what your thoughts are on that. So, um, yeah, well, this gets into my, you know, PEDS ID uh, <laughs> stuff. By the way, I want to correct one thing earlier. I'm not division director of infectious disease, but of pediatric infectious disease. Oh, okay. Big difference. Just because it's a big difference. Yeah. You know, um, I work, I get to work with the nicest people in the world, <laughs> um, pediatricians and infectious disease people. Um, so there's, there's a couple things also. This is another area I think it's important to differentiate. I think if you look, and I'm looking at the data every day, and all my colleagues are in pediatric disease, it really truly does look that those sort of under the age of 12 that we're seeing very little disease. There have been a few severe cases. Some of those, a few of those have been immunocompromised, but I don't think now that this is moving around the world that we're really missing that because we're in contact with our friends in Italy and all around the world that um, infants, newborns, um, children are not getting serious, really serious infections as a rule, and they're getting fewer infections. So like our numbers here at Vanderbilt are really supportive of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that we're not, you know, that seeing serious infections. So then when you get, I think, up, and, and this is something interesting. SARS-1 was like this as well. There was very little pediatric disease. But when you hit adolescence, you started seeing this sort of spectrum building up until over 18. It just looked like, it's kind of like it decided what's the voting age. You know, it just said, <laughs> let's, th- and that's who it's really targeting. Now, I think there's a couple other things. One is that, um, I, uh, so I, I don't get these curves exactly right. I'm not an epidemiologist, but the the data that I'm seeing indicates to me that you may have the same risk of getting infection across the age spectrum, mm-hmm. but the but the, but and then there may be an exponential increase in in the probability of severity as you get in above the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay, but I think it's emerging also that the, the, you can definitely any age from 18 on you can have the whole range of disease. And in fact, in Tennessee, so far as state, it looks like that um, is in the Tennessee in this morning, that a, a majority of the severe cases in Tennessee are people under the age of 50. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a significant amount of that that are in people between sort of 18 and 40. So I think this is a, you know, this is a falsehood that can lead to the idea that we can hang out and don't worry, not to worry about it. We're not at risk. Definitely with hospitalization, severe disease and death is occurring in younger age groups. Immune senescence in the elderly clearly is an issue. It was in the animal models that Ralph studied and others studied. And so that's uh, just a couple of points about that. Okay. Okay. Can we learn anything about the duration of immunity from the endemic coronas from SARS-1 and MERS? You know, um, I've, I've wanted to go back and find my articles that I wrote about back in the day when I was working with MHV and trying to justify my existence by writing about cold viruses with um, of C43 and 229E, which were the only two known human coronaviruses back in the 80s and 90s, mm-hmm. uh, first discovered in the in the 60s. Some of that work was done in, in Bob Chanik's group, right? Um, yeah. A lot of that work, um, really good work. And some of these MR, some of these actually challenge cold, human cold challenge units in the in in U, the UK and in the US. Um, 
and I haven't reviewed the data. So if someone, someone could definitely check me on this, but my uh, analysis of this back in the day was that human cold viruses, we, we have, we get immunity. That immunity is not durable. So if I have H, HKU1 in year one and get 229E in year two, I can get HKU1 again in year three and, H, and 229 again in year four. Those tend to be mild infections. So mm-hmm. what can you say about protection from severe disease? It's hard to say when you have an endemic virus. But they, I, I've always thought of coronavirus as more like RSV, that your goal of immunity is to prevent severe disease. Yeah. It's not to prevent infection. So it's not like measles. It's not going to be like um, chicken pox. It's not going to be like uh, pertussis where you actually prevent disease, any kind of illness that your goal is to prevent severe disease. Um, I think the, the, the SARS models s- suggest that you can get a, a strong immunity because of how SARS came and went. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a chance and obviously there wasn't a challenge model to check for durable immunity that was really protective. And there were some concerns raised with um, if, if spike was presented in the wrong form and the wrong mechanism, that there might be something associated with immune enhanced disease. So I think that, that, that those are all possible. I think a goal here is to develop a, uh, a goal here would be number one, to prevent people from being hospitalized and prevent this kind of drama would be to create some form of a herd immunity that allows for this virus to, uh, to settle in and, and potentially actually be, be an endemic human disease that's much milder you know can we accelerate its evolution down a path of um of either complete control or one where population is is broadly immunized either by the disease or by the vaccine and then allow it to sort of live its life with us without causing this kind of dramatic disruption so i guess that means that uh, any vaccine that uh, is developed and there are a whole bunch in development they probably won't be what we call sterilizing, as you said. They will per- permit infection, but uh, no, not severe disease, right? You know, um, that's the, that's a speculation on my part. I'm as hopeful as everybody else that these strategies that will be used will actually be sterilizing. Mm-hmm. This is a new virus; we don't know, and we never, and it was never tested with SARS. So that, I'm just basing that on human viruses. So yeah. I'm I'm as optimistic and hopeful, and uh, you know whatever higher power that this, that these vaccines will really kick in fast. We can get them on board and, and make a difference. So we have never made vaccines against these endemic coronas of which there are four now, right? Because the, the infections are not serious enough. Is that right? Yeah. I think that there wasn't, you know, when we look at these in the hospital here of now with these multiplex PCRs, we're looking at, they're called respiratory pathogen panels, right? Yeah. They may have tons of things on them. And now when people are in ICU and they're getting sick or when they get back a, uh, RPP and it has OC43 or HKU1 on it, mm-hmm. everybody scratches their head and says, is that real or not? <laughs> and I think it's been intermittent enough and, uh, the, and it's been um, you know anecdotal enough that there have there clearly can be severe disease with those. But in general, they're like the rhino, they would be more like the rhinoviruses. Yeah. They might exacerbate asthma. They mm-hmm. might cause a bad cold occasionally and like uh, troops that were in the, in um, Korea or other places that were in tight complexes, you would get outbreaks mm-hmm. or in a nursing home where you had significant deaths associated with NL63. So those, those things can happen, but they're exceptions. And so I think the market for that was not one that was really great. Yeah. Although for rhinoviruses, some people are exploring vaccines because they, they have a big burden of infection, right? It's huge. And the economic implications of that are huge. It's, it's a hidden, it's a hidden economic burden. And I've always argued that that was very important. Um, and I and maybe this will have people take a look at all of those. Yeah, there. I suppose we don't understand why some viruses provide durable sterilizing immunity and others don't, right? No, um, no. I think we. I, well, one is is it would obviously be is is there a single strain or a, a single focus? So you know, we've been fortunate in general with with like uh, like I said with varicella and with measles um, and um, with other things that you can get it's a single strain it works around the world um i think it's also the type of immunity that it provides so when you have vaccines that are live virus vaccines right you get both humo immunity and you have your your t-cell immunity all up and running so it's likely we get reinfected with those viruses in a very limited fashion so in some sense it's not sterilizing in the sense of preventing infection but it's but if it happens all it's going to do is boost your immunity and you're never going to see it you're never going to see it advance in mm-hmm. disease. 
You know, so I'm not an expert in those areas, so it's a little hard for me to comment. I, I can't help thinking, having having been talking with a lot of people lately, is how how much our understanding of virus infections has changed over the years. You know, back in the day when we could isolate some in cell culture, we could do some serology, and now we can do respiratory panels and find nucleic acids, how it's just changing our view, right? There's one thing that I have been working with is that, uh, you know, an acute virus, the RNA may persist for months, even yeah. after the virus yeah. is gone. Well, I have a student in my lab, uh, Jennifer Gribble, who is doing some amazing work, and hopefully we'll have her, her work out soon, um, looking at um, um, what viruses, what, what coronaviruses are making in the cell and what they're packaging. Mm-hmm. And, and then a lot of this was predicated on the DARPA program that we were involved in for a while that was looking at defective genomes right. and packaging. And our, our data suggesting that the coronavirus uh, virion may just be a grab bag that literally is not being selective at all, but it's, it's packaging stuff that you wouldn't believe, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of fragments and truncated things and defective genomes. Um, and and that, that that's likely is selected in some way, right? Over time, that's been selected. That there's a reason for that. Yes. That these viruses are doing this, and we're also really exploring. I know others are, but um, I think we're really in an exciting position to look at using nanopore direct RNA sequencing. You know, mm-hmm. and how could we use that not just to understand the biology, but could we use it to really do something at point of care if if that kind of technology advances that you could basically be able to say, here's the genome that you have. Not only are you infected, but here's the genome you have, and here's the variants that we're seeing within that genome, and maybe begin to link those to pathogenesis. Can't help thinking about uh, Harry Ginsburg, who hired me at Columbia. You must have known him, right? He um, he was a he was a colleague of Bob Chanuk, he, and he would always bristle when people said this is a non-essential viral gene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said it's there for some reason. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think if, you know, again, I come back to the issue of trying to I encourage young virologists, especially whose, whose minds are still agile, to try to spend a day just thinking of the virus from a purely selective position. Don't don't let anything say the virus does or the virus, you know, achieves, because I think if you think of things purely from a selection perspective, then what's there in some ways has been selected to allow the virus ecology to persist for that virus to survive over time. And so our, our, it's like Jeopardy. The answer is there. We just got to figure out what the question is. I, I think that's perfect. I totally agree with you. I, th- I tell people all the time, don't think if, about it from your perspective. Right. Look at it from an ecological perspective. Right. Just try and understand what are the selective forces that makes things happen, and then you get a better view. So let's talk a little bit about one of your big specialties, which is uh, antiviral approaches. And I think we could start by... Uh, discussing a little bit something unique to the coronavirus is this three prime five prime exonuclease and why that makes uh, your work a little more challenging. Maybe you could explain that to us. Well, you know, we started um, this work. There was, you know, the coronavirus genome is two to three times larger than the next largest RNA virus genome. The order in which the family coronaviridae is in is, are the nidovirales. The nidovirales are uh, contain multiple different families. Um, one of which, the arteriviridae, the arteriviruses are much smaller. They're about 15 kV, and the coronaviruses are about 30 on average. I had always thought that was a fascinating question. For most people, it was like, why in the heck would you work with coronaviruses, that big, messy genome? Mm-hmm. That was sort of the basis for how people cared about that. Um, but we always thought it was interesting. And then there were some beautiful studies, and of course, Sasha Gorbelania and others have led the way on this, looking at beginning to just sequence gaze and and he did it you know without supercomputers and everything just just with great knowledge but looking at this and identifying this region within the the coronavirus genome that looked like a um that looked like just a few basic um um amino acids that might be organized around um around um a particular region that looked like they might be the active sites for ex- an exonuclease. And when he did that and he, and he found those, he proposed that this might be a, um, a, a, a three prime to five prime exonuclease. And those are enzymes that are known to be proofreading in other organisms, particularly in yeast and in bacteria. So our work then started from that and um, work, the, the initial studies were done by Lance Eckerly in my lab, who basically was able to make a mutant in MHV where he inactivated those residues and found that the virus made up to 20 times more mutations every time it replicated, mm-hmm. 
It was highly viable. We could adapt it. And subsequently, we've done a tremendous amount of work of that, looking at its adaptation, what its stability, uh, potentially how it functions. But the key observation we had made that led to our studies of antivirals was that it um, that we could never get ribavirin to work or 5-fluorouracil to work. It was like the virus couldn't have cared less about mm. those drugs, no matter how much we used and, that, and then when we inactivated the exonuclease, the viruses became profoundly sensitive in a dose-dependent manner to those compounds. Mm. That was really the basis for our beginning to look at antivirals. So I wasn't an expert in drug development. Um, I'm, I'm like a person who learns a language late in life. I'm not very good at it, but I'm really enthusiastic. Right? I'm really a powerfully enthusiastic. And this was really based on, and that's why we focused on nucleoside analogs as well. Could we find ones that could inhibit this proofreading function and inhibit coronaviruses broadly. So the problem is that if you have a drug that introduces, like ribavirin, that introduces mutations, the ex, this this exo activity will fix it, right? Yeah, it does. It does. It absolutely does. And, and we've shown over and over again that ribavirin doesn't work, but people keep wanting to try it yeah. um, against these viruses, and we'd say, okay, but yeah, but it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and and so what the. I, I, I don't know if you were at this meeting, Vince, but I, uh, there was a, a, a coronavirus meeting in San Rafael in France in 2012. I had been doing a sabbatical with Marco Benuzzi and Pasteur, and so I was the only coronavirus poster at a, a coronavirus meeting. <laughs> so I went along to this meeting, and that's where I uh, met and talked with Greg Cameron, who was doing work with nucleoside analogs in picornaviruses. Um and so he suggested that I contact Gilead Sciences with their with their drug um, and talk to them about are they, did they have compounds that we could test? And after a long courtship, we um, they gave us a compound blinded that we ultimately identified as remdesivir, and we were really shocked. The very first experiment that Brett Case did in my lab with it showed that it worked mm. perfectly well, and that that was just blew our that just sort of blew the top off it, and that was really the start for us looking at nucleoside analogs that could get by the proofreading function. It's funny that you say that. I went to a coronavirus meeting in Spain once as a sole picornavirologist. I remember. I remember you being there. <laughs> <laughs> to see what they could learn from us. It, you know, I, I really encourage scientists, if they can, you know, once every year, a couple of years to go to a meeting where they have absolutely no a virology meeting of another family, a plus strand, a minus strand, a double strand, a DNA virus meeting. Um, because I find that investigators are profoundly open to sharing and open. There's It's an open book. And, and I had... I had three collaborations, um, two grants, and I think five papers come out of that meeting mm. because I visited and Great. talked to different people. Yeah. So, what, what was how was remdesivir originally discovered? So remdesivir, I don't know its original discovery. It's um, there's a parent compound called GS four four one five two four that was a Gilead drug. Um, I don't know the details, but I know that it was one of the ones that was involved in their early studies against hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. Right. So they had a whole stable of chemical compounds okay. Okay. that they were testing and some didn't, you know, like sofosbuvir obviously move forward. Right. But others I think were active against hep C, but they didn't, um, but they couldn't be used for long-term use in animals for some reason or another. So they had these on, on the shelves and they had evidence that these were work, potentially working against other viruses like Ebola, et cetera. So, so I think that that's, and then they did, uh, you know, they do a dramatic number. They're able to do this large number of chemical modifications for prodrugs to increase their, their, their activity, to increase their penetration, to increase their phosphorylation, uh, get them inside cells, et cetera. And so that was really the compounds that they shared with us that we were able to, that we were able to test. Okay. So remdesivir is a chain terminator. Is that right? Yeah. It's called a non-obligate chain terminator, which is an interesting, it sounds like an oxymoron. Um, it basically incorporates and then actually usually one or two nucleotides after it incorporates the chain terminates. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. I don't understand that chemistry. I don't understand that biochemistry. Other people would have to explain it better, but they basically function as a single molecule that gets in and, and truncates the RNA chain. So this, this drug inhibits SARS-1 in cell culture. Is that correct? Uh, it, um, so our goal when we set up this with the, with the, um, with the grant, and this is a, a U19 through the University of Alabama, Birmingham from NIAID called ADC3, Antiviral Drug Development Consortium or something, <laughs> A3C. Um, we, uh, Ralph and I then put together a project for that and to test remdesivir and other compounds. So the, um, 
events. I just forgot your question. So, uh, which, what coronaviruses Sorry. are inhibited by remdesivir? Yes, thank you. I do that all the time. Don't worry. Um, are you my age? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. So our goal, the goal of our study, we aren't drug development people. So the goal of our study, because of Ralph's fantastic work, right, early, early work with MHV, then with the presence of SARS, the presence of MERS, and then knowing that there were these at least two of these bat viruses that were directly capable of infecting human cells mm -hmm. that published work. Um, we said we're not we don't want to work with a compound unless it inhibits every coronavirus we test because we're, we're worried about MERS. We're worried about SARS-1. But they're not really they're they're not our problem. The future is the problem, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we have a. I'll send you the little statement we had in our significance. You know, which you always put in, saying these guys are coming back. We're really worried about this. So what we so what was actually done is we actually started with MHV mouse hepatitis virus, mm -hmm. and then we tested it against SARS and MERS and showed the activity, and then Ralph took it and tested it against NL sixty three. Um, HKU3, which is a SARS-like bat coronavirus, HKU5, which is a MERS-like bat coronavirus, and then WIV and SCH014, which were these, quote, pre-pandemic bat viruses that were out there that we knew could infect human cells. And we showed that it had activity against every single one of these viruses. Okay. And now we've all we've both tested it in both of our labs, and there was a thing in cell reports that showed a very brief figure about activity, and our, our evidence is that it's active against these uh, the new virus as yeah. well. Okay, and it's also been tested in animal models for the older coronaviruses, right? Correct for SARS for SARS for SARS. That's work that Tim Sheehan and Amy Sims have really led in Rouse Lab um, in collaboration with us, um, showing that it's high that it's highly active. This is an important point, I think, for trials is that this virus um, in their testing, if you gave it prophylactically, it knocked the virus down and it prevents a disease mm -hmm. really well. If you gave it a day or two after infection, it knocked down virus and ameliorated disease significantly. If you gave it after the animal, the, the, the animal model is, is truncated, right? So that they develop disease much faster, starting about two to four days. Um, if you give it after that, it always knocks the virus down multiple logs, but it doesn't really impact the disease outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was talking about, about the immunopathogenesis. So this is not unique to coronaviruses. This was also true in the, in the SARS model. This was in a SARS model. So I think in terms of the design of the trial for Remdesivir right now, when I was involved in that and others, the idea is you can't just give it in a setting where you have people already who have severe disease, say they're on a ventilator or something, because mm -hmm. you're, you're setting it up to say that this drug doesn't work. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and I think that, so I think that the design of that is one that's really about, um, looking at mild and moderate disease as well, virologic endpoints and, and immunologic endpoints as well as disease endpoints. Because I think we need to not just say, you know, the, the worry right now in this current world, and I understand it 100%, is that it's like we need something to work, you know, and then it's, it does it work or does it not work? And I think that that is not the best way to go about this because we need to be able to move forward from the data we get from these studies to find ways that are more effective. So, so trials are in progress with remdesivir. It is. There's approved for a severe disease and a mild and moderate disease, and it started up in multiple institutions, and, and yeah. uh, including Vanderbilt. Although the the approval for severe disease is, as you say, setting it up for failure in a way, right? I, you know, I hope not. I mean, because because humans aren't mice, yeah. right? And yeah. SARS is uh, SARS two is not SARS one, and and um, if you can. If, if you can get someone to have recovery reco and, and the way the mice are studied isn't the way we would, would think about humans, right? So if you can get someone off a ventilator in a week instead of two weeks, mm. right? if you can help them to survive and have, a, and have a good life after that, that's profoundly useful. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that this might, uh, this might occur. Um, we, I think what it points out more is that we have to be really thinking about how can we either manage or prevent or limit the immunopathology as well as the virology. So we should be thinking about how we can extend the therapeutic window, right? So are there immunomodulators that we could use in association with a direct acting antiviral that would allow us to um, that would allow us to really make an effective treatment as well as you know treat treat the virus as well? Do we have any immunomodulators that are candidates? You know, there are people that are looking at IL six inhibitors. Yeah. I mean, based on some. Um, some other studies, um, you know, you could even imagine you could use very, if you had a direct acting antiviral that was really effective, you might even be able to use more, 
more dramatic ones like steroids right now, that's not a good idea, but that's because you can't knock the virus down. Yeah. Right. So, so I don't saying that we should do that right now. Yeah. Definitely not. Got it. But I think there's ways to think about that. Can we target, um, can we target different steps in the pathway along with rectifying antivirals? So uh, why does remdesivir work with uh, this exonuclease in the genome? Hey, um, like, give me a grant for life, and I want to know this. This is, I, I'm, I'm, this is killing me. I, I guess I'd like to answer that question by talking about uh, really quickly. I'd like to mention one other drug, if I could. Yeah, yeah of um, course. Um, it's called um, NHC, uh, beta D N four hydroxycytidine. Um, this is another compound that um, Maria Agostini in my lab um, has published. Maria was a grad student who just finished within the period of five years had identified two uh, nucleoside analogs highly active against every coronavirus in vitro and in vivo. So not, not a bad little term of graduate school, but um, this compound we like because it sort of meets all the same metrics as remdesivir. Mm -hmm. It's being developed out of Emory university. They're, they're working to get an emergency or to get a rapid IND for this. It meets all those same criteria. It blocks the exonuclease. We don't understand that one either. And it's orally bioavailable. Mm -hmm. So remdesivir is IV, so that limits its use. And NHC, as we call it, is um, orally bioavailable. And so um, we've published, in collaboration with Ralph, we've published the in vitro studies. And Tim Sheehan is, it has now, in BioArchive, has a paper uh, showing its activity, its efficacy in animal models. So um, this gets back to my, my issue of how do, how do they work. Well, NHC is a mutagen. And it's it functions by probably by lethal mutagenesis. Uh, remdesivir functions by chain termination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got these really complementary mechanisms, and um, we've even shown that um, resistance to remdesivir leads to increased sensitivity to NHC. Wow! So this idea that we've got two things that block the exonuclease that both are capable of functioning against the polymerase by different mechanisms. Is, is really makes us want to work fast and hard to try to understand this biology. Neither one, remdesivir or NHC, neither one inhibits the exo, is that correct? You know, um, so here's the deal. When you knock out the exonuclease, they both are much more sensitive. Uh, so the virus is much more sensitive to both drugs. Right. The difference is they're able to work at very low, uh, at low nanomolar concentrations in the presence of the exonuclease anyway. Uh -huh. So... We think it would be fascinating to try to understand, could we find exonuclease inhibitors yeah, Yes, <laughs> that would basically make the virus susceptible? You basically knock out its superpower right. and you make it susceptible. It's sort of its kryptonite, right? If you can knock out its superpower of, of proofreading, then any nucleoside analog might be effective because we think coronaviruses have, may have abdicated their proofreading functions from the polymerase to the exonuclease. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they may have a wimpy polymerase in terms of any kind of fidelity or proofreading uh, or limitations yeah. on that. Yeah, and exo, so no one has looked at exonuclease inhibitors, right, ever? Um, there, we are starting to look at some, and Andrea uh, Prousers in my lab has been beginning to look at those, and we have preliminary data to suggest that um, if you knock out, if you can damage the exonuclease, you can get increased sensitivity to these drugs. So you could do it chemically, theoretically. Mm. Yeah. We, um, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's really early to try to understand that. And all of these compounds, unfortunately, the ones that are available are either just, you know, tough chemicals um, and they also would affect other exonucleases in the host. Yeah. Right. So they're not something that could go anywhere close to a human, but, but the proof of principle is really we, we need to be looking not just at now at SARS-2 as devastating as it is, you know, from a clinical and an economic perspective. But we need to be looking at SARS-3 already. We need to be doing that and we need to be moving forward in that process. I mean, I think we should be able to develop broadly acting antivirals that would hit any SARS that came out of bats, right? Um, I think the ones we see already do, actually. Uh -huh. The question is, is, do they work? And so I think that that says that we, sh we should be able to do that. Particularly the group 2B ones, the ones that are SARS-like, right? Yeah. SARS and the new one in these bat viruses all really came out of a smaller cluster um, that we think we should target more extensively yeah. for, for studies. Are there any other antivirals? I noticed one in one of your papers, BCX4430. Is that working? Yeah, we, we didn't study that. Um, okay. We're interested in, we, 
one of the first things I did when I had few tools, few genetic tools, and and I'm not sure I had too much of a toolkit at all, was uh, looking at protease inhibitors early on because yeah. the coronavirus replicates polyprotein has 16 proteins and two to three proteases, and they're really susceptible. Um, protease inhibitors might be a really good augmentation. There's there's one that I I, I really think is interesting. I um, it's called GC three seven six. It's been published against the feline coronavirus, mm-hmm. uh, feline infectious peritonitis virus. And there's sort of a, a an online group of people who love their cats and keep trying to get this on the black market and get it made um, mm-hmm. and in used because um, it, it it looks very effective and our, our early work suggests that it's maybe active here too as well. Yeah. So we think that that's something. I, and so I don't know its status or where it is, but the idea of combination therapy is really important. The idea that we could hit the proteases, three, two proteases, we could hit those. We might be able to hit the protease that's required for entry, tempers two, right? Yeah. So tempers yeah. two that cleaves the spike or cathepsin inhibitors, right? Calpane or cathepsin inhibitors. Um, along with nucleoside analogs and potentially along with monoclonal antibodies that target the spike before the virus even gets close to the cell. Yeah. So I think that we need to, th- we need to not just get outside the box. We need to throw the box away and we need to be getting away from our academic and our, um, and our ac- monetary imperatives because our world is being really impacted by this. And we need to go fast. I, I think that's a great point because, in fact, we could have been ready for this had we invested in the interim from SARS one, right? Well, I, you know, the NIH supported these um, these these our studies, right, and has continued to do that. So, but we're a small shop, yeah, and we're one of maybe two or three labs that was studying antivirals against coronavirus in a slow, methodical way. So, the ability to advance those, um, I'm more interested in working with people who would like to step away from their um the their individual their academic and or their industrial imperatives and say um we we don't care we need to help we need to help humanity and can we try these things together Uh, i am i am uh, you know me and i know you we're scientists and and i'm confident that i'm naive and pollyanna about that but i think that's how we have to think and it's how we have to move forward i totally agree with you um and that's why i like these initiatives like cepi Right. right, nonprofits right. supporting uh, research that no company will go near, and right. I think the world has changed, and we have to have a new metric, a new model for developing drugs that help save people's lives. It can't all be profit driven. Anyway, that's my shtick. Yeah, you know, I do have to say that our interactions, you know, and I'm I'm not um, I don't I'm getting, I don't get any financial support from directly from Gilead. It comes from the NIH. Um, that's been a, a fascinating public private partnership and people say those yeah, yeah. I, I think that's worked very well um with the nih with our, our labs and and with them and the support that they've given for this um it's been continuous and it was in a period of time where they really didn't have to do that as a company because there was really no market for it yeah but yeah. they but they did yeah that's good some companies are good like that i agree um so the 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 Dual therapy, we've learned from hep C treatment and HIV, you need more than one drug. You know, right now everyone's focusing on one, but you're right. The the combination in the long term is going to be essential. Right? Yeah. 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 And and this idea that when we, you know, have resistance to um, remdesivir, that it's more sensitive to NHC to us is an exciting thing. Yes, I think thing, it's very that, cool. it, that it says the polymerase um, may have to do very, very specific things to block these analogs. Yeah. Proteus inhibitors are more challenging because they tend to target the active site. And if they're absolutely required, then there's an absolute selection for resistance. So you do have to have multiple compounds. Um, and that is really one of the goals that we have going forward. So one more target we didn't mention, the RNA polymerase. Is is anyone working on that? Well, that is really what we're targeting. I mean, that is what these drugs target. And that's where our resistance mutations arise. The exonuclease, we haven't actually seen mutations, adaptive mutations in the exonuclease against these. The, the resistance mutations that arise, arise in the polymerase. Are there and any? So um, there are other, there are lots and lots of nucleoside analogs now. We're, we're, we're discovering there's hundreds of them around the world that we never knew about <laughs> because yeah. people are asking us if we're interested. And we are. I would like to focus on that because I, I, think, the, um, I think the coronavirus polymerase is very sensitive. And we know that. From you know knocking out the XON, we can we can use any nucleoside analog to block the polymerase. Are there any non-nucleoside uh, inhibitors? 
Um, I don't know. Um, those might be ones that people do have. Um, I would be very interested in, in mm -hmm. thinking about those um, ones that would bind the polymerase or um, that aren't nucleoside analogs, for example, right? Right. Or that might be targeting the interface. You know, coronaviruses that uh, we think have recapitulated this sort of uh, DNA Paul three like complex processivity factors, RNA binding clamps, helicase mm -hmm. ATPAs. Uh, probably the capping enzymes are involved in that as well, as well as the polymerase, the exonuclease, and, and, and the exonuclease cofactor. They're all working together. And so there's, there's ways that you could disrupt that complex probably by, by multiple ways that wouldn't require you to target the polymerase directly. Got it. All right, one more thing, Mark. A lot of, a lot of people seem to have forgotten about this, but early on we learned that the closest uh, virus that we know of to SARS-CoV-2 is a, is a bad isolate from 2013. And that's kind of disappeared from uh, the news, I guess. But what are your thoughts on the origins of SARS-CoV-2? Well, this is, you know, this is a bad virus. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'll just, I'll just, you know, it's like pull it out of my head. I mean, when you look, um, I can send you a figure. When you look, there, there's an interesting clay. There's the, there's the SARS viruses, the civet and the SARS-1. Mm -hmm. And then there's these SARS-like viruses in a, in a little slightly different clay that include some of these um, pre-pandemic ones. And then there's sort of a, 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 a not distant, but a, a, a separate split out that has um, SARS-2 and it has the pangolin viruses in it. And it has these, um, and it has some bad viruses that are very closely related, greater than 96% nucleotide identity mm -hmm. to SARS-2. And, and I think this, any, any other stuff about this is really nonsense. I mean, it's possible it came from another animal into bats, but it's a bad virus and it didn't need any help from anybody to do what it's doing. It was opportunity. This was an opportunity, opportunist that was living happily in a small ecological niche and then had an opportunity, whether that was a person who went into a bat cave, you know, the filled with guano and, and you know, lots of coronaviruses and then had a mild disease and brought it back and nucleated the event or whether it was a bat in a, in a market that had potential for intermediate hosts. Mm. I think that, um, I think that's all worth studying and understanding. What's worth studying and understanding. Number one is preserving bats. Number two, uh, really trying to get a much better surveillance and, um, and catalog encyclopedia yeah, of yeah, yeah. bad viruses where they exist. And then what we have to recognize is we can talk about that stuff all we want, but this is now a human virus yeah. and we need to think about it as a human virus For and, sure. and not, and not try to say, and then think about ways that we, we interact with wildlife that we might um, be sure that we leave the wildlife alone and prevent these kinds of transmissions from occurring. All right. One more question. I promise. You, you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, cathepsins and TMPRSS cleaving the spike so it can mm -hmm. undergo uh, conformational change for fusion. There's a furin site in the spike. Do you think yeah. that is being cleaved for, for fusion? Yeah. I, that's very possible too. So there's there's always, it's been known that different coronaviruses, you know, so I, I call them, are they cleaved on the way in? Or are they cleaved on the way out? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, yeah. so um, there's, there's versions of MHV, MHV 59, I'm, 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 Susan Weiss will kill me. I'm going to probably get this wrong. There's, um, <laughs> I think, well, I'll just say there's two versions of MHV2 and MHV859. One of them is cleaved on the way in. Uh -huh. Okay. And the other is cleaved on the way out. It also has to do with, you know, how many copies or how many residues there are at that furin cleavage site, right? I mean, this was the same with the flu, right? That, mm -hmm. that changed that furin cleavage site and went from a mild disease to a serious systemic and respiratory disease. Yeah. Yeah. So I think furin would be an exciting target um, if there were ways to target it specifically that weren't detrimental to the host, of course, that um, would be an exciting target for preventing it. So if, if you had a combination, once we know more about the virus, is, is, is primary cleavage on the way in or on the way out or both? And so you could target it two different ways yeah. to prevent that spike from being cleaved. Great. Perfect. I'm about to teach uh, a lecture today uh, to my virology class about determinants of tropism and host range. And that's, you know, there's a structure already of the spike from Jason there McClellan showing where, the, structure. showing where the, the furin site is. It's just amazing how, how things happen under pressure, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the, the other issue, I guess, is the other issue is the... 
is how this the Moderna, at least the Moderna vaccine was designed. I'm not familiar with all the different vaccine approaches, but that one was done by Barney Graham. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't done by him, of course, in his lab. But um, this idea of how rapidly they were able to get the in this um, this fusion stabilized, the, the pre-fusion form mm-hmm. of the spike, which has, I think, more opportunity promise for um, like they did with RSV for a structure that may form an immune response that's yeah, going yeah. to be native and protective. And I think that's a, a incredibly important uh, key discovery to move forward quickly. So when, when we say pre-fusion, that means there's no cleavage site. Is that right? No, it means, um, it mean, um, okay, I'm not going to know the biology of this accurately. All I know is they've designed it with mutations so that the fusion protein um, isn't, is locked in place. It's locked into the prefusion form, okay. so I'm not sure if that's the spike or I mean if that's cleavage or what the mechanism is, but it's but it's yeah, basically yeah. locked it. in place. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either because they don't they're very secretive about that. Of course, well, no, I think the, the the approach to that is published because that's been published with RSV. RSV and others. Yeah. So the approach to prefusion, so, uh, Barney has multiple uh, papers in Science and other places that 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 really look at the how you do it. And Jason has published some of those structures as well for other so, viruses. So, so. It's, it's a similar yeah. approach for the spike yeah. of corona. Yes, very, very much so. Okay, and I great. don't know exactly how they're doing it. Mark, that's been great. Really nice uh, 50 minutes chatting with you. Is there anything you wanted to touch on before I say goodbye? No. Um, um, I, let's, let's keep all working together on this and thank our public health and our our physicians and those nurses and the staff and everybody who's staying in these hospitals and caring for these patients and, and my best, my best um, feelings from thoughts for New York and other places that are experiencing this, including here. But, um, and as we do the science with enthusiasm, you know, we feel a real, I feel like we've been deployed, right? We've been arguing this for years and then this happens. I feel like we have an obligation to really, uh, stay here, work hard, and do the best we can. Um, I hope we can have an impact on the current epidemic, but we need to be looking to the future as well. Yep. All right, that's a special episode of TWIV. You can find it on any podcast player, microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, communicating science here, consider supporting us financially microbe.tv slash contribute my guest today from vanderbilt university school of medicine mark dennison thanks a lot mark i appreciate it my pleasure vince thank you and i always like talking science we we had lunch at that washington meeting and uh we, we just talked continuously because uh science is fascinating especially viruses yeah indeed. I, i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.blog i want to thank asv and asm for their support of twiv and ronald jenkies for the music this episode of twiv was recorded edited and posted by me vincent racaniello you've been listening to this week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral